and welcome back to The Casual Couch with me and Kinshu. Kinshu, please, please stop stabbing me. So, this is a read-along. Hi, hello, if you're new here, uh, hi. This is gonna be a bit different. I have several of these already on my channel that you've probably checked out before now, but if not, feel free to go check those out. What I do is I take a book and I sit here and I read it and uh, I talk about it as I read it, both comedically, hopefully, making jokes and jabs and such, and also talking about it from the point of view of an author and what the author of the book is doing well, what they're doing poorly, that kind of thing. Now, up until now, I have been reading books that were not great, but my viewers were like, we want to see you read something that you like. So today, we are going to start this read-along of one of my favorite books of all time, Dealing with Dragons. Just look at this, look at this cover. It wraps around and there's like all these characters that we'll get to meet on the back. And just look at Simmerine on the front. She is so full of sass. I love her. So I've been like putting off doing this read-along because I am super worried that it's going to be really boring. At least this book is short, but I am legitimately worried that this is going to be really boring because it's a lot harder to make jokes about something that you're just loving. And sometimes it can also be a lot harder to articulate why you love something versus why you don't like something. And I'm just worried that it's just not going to be very enter entertaining. So I've been like finding any excuse not to do it, but I'm like, I got to do it. This is a used book, and so it's a little bit older, so it's starting to have that book smell. I'm actually going to take the dust cover off. As much as I love it, it's slippery. So some of you may be familiar with Dealing with Dragons, and its lead character, Princess Simmerine, who is like the, in my opinion, the proto-princess uh, who doesn't want to be a princess. Let's just get into it with chapter one which is titled, In Which Simmerine Refuses to Be Proper and Has a Conversation with a Frog. Any noises you hear in the background, by the way, are my pets. Right away, I wanna highlight something, right away. So it starts out just telling you a bit about the kingdom, which can be very boring, but because this author is just such a snappy writer, she knows how to make something boring read interesting. So it starts out, Linderwall was a large kingdom just east of the Mountains of Morning straightforward, where the philosophers were highly respected, and the number five was fashionable. I think this is a great way to introduce your world if you must start your book this way, which I don't know that you must. This is a bit of an old-fashioned way to start a book, I would say, but doing something like that where it's like, here's a couple of bland facts and here's something fun. It really works, and it flows, and five, fashionable, it just, it works. We also set up right away that Simmerine is different. She has all, she has many sisters and they're all, you know, the perfect princesses with the blonde hair and the blue eyes and the pale complexions and the sweet dispositions. And then there's Simmerine who for some reason has black hair and like striking eyes and she's tall. She dares to be tall. And um, that makes me wonder like, did the queen get bored and maybe visit a strapping young stable lad or something to produce Simmerine because one of these things is not like the others. We're not gonna worry about that though. This is a, this is a middle grade bordering on young adult book. We learn that Simmerine is into fencing. She would go down to the armory and bully the armor master into giving her fencing lessons. Always a plus. We cannot fault 12 year old Simmerine for her logic. Her father says, fencing is not proper behavior for a princess. Simmerine tilted her head to one side. Why not? It's, well, it's simply not done. Simmerine considered, aren't I a princess? Yes, of course you are, my dear, said her father with relief. He had been bracing himself for a storm of tears, which is the way his other daughters reacted to reprimands. Well, I fence, Simmerine said with the air of one delivering an un unshakable argument. So it is too done by princesses. And I be shooting for my own hand. <laughs> so Simmerine keeps sneaking lessons of different varieties that she's not supposed to do and keeps getting caught and told to stop doing them until she finally gets fed up and summons her fairy godmother whom apparently she can just summon up. 
Something else that this book does I think really well is that we don't, it doesn't bog us down with the world building of like why or how Simmerine can summon her fairy godmother. It's a fairy tale world, she can do it, it's not important how. Simmerine's fairy godmother uh, tells her that it's just a phase she's going through, so relatable to uh, any teenager who's struggling. So Simmerine's fairy godmother is absolutely no help. Simmerine's parents take her to visit a nearby kingdom, and at first she's excited because, you know, she's getting out of the house, but then she finds out to her horror that she has been promised in marriage to the exceedingly dull-witted and uninteresting prince there. His name is Prince Therindil, and he'll, he'll be back. It was he who would chance the perilous journey through blistering cold and scorching desert. Like I said, I hope this isn't boring, me just like pointing out things that I like, but I love this passage. Simmerine's trying to find reasons why she shouldn't marry Prince Therindil. He hasn't rescued me from a giant or an ogre or freed me from a magic spell, Simmerine said. Both her parents looked uncomfortable. Well, no, said Simmerine's father. It's a bit late to start arranging it, but we might be able to manage something. I don't think it's necessary, Simmerine's mother said. She looked reprovingly at Simmerine. You've never paid attention to what was or wasn't suitable, my dear, and you can start now. So this like this notion that they would arrange for her to be like kidnapped or put under a spell or something to make it proper. I know nowadays we are used to this kind of like subversion of fairy tale themes and stuff, but back when this book was written, it wasn't nearly done as much. Shrek hadn't come along yet, you know? So it was pretty original and I still think it is fairly original in the way that it operates. Simmerine goes to see Therindil. He's an idiot. So she gives up on him and goes to the castle garden where she encounters a talking frog. Naturally she assumes he's a prince under a spell, but in reality he's just a frog who has learned to talk by meeting multiple enchanted princes. And I love that too. And here the story itself reminds us that a main character needs to have agency and, and act rather than react. The frog says, I didn't ask what you'd said about it, the frog snapped. I asked what you were going to do. Nine times out of ten, talking is a way of avoiding doing things. So the frog and Simmerine are going over her options, and she lists a bunch of things that she can do. Of course, her fencing lessons were cut short, her magic lessons were cut short, and her cooking lessons were cut short, but she mentions that she can make Cherry's Jubilee. Which, believe it or not, will come up later, which I'm just going to mention it now. One of the things that I like about Cimmerine is that, and this book, is that it doesn't say that all things feminine are bad. All things that are traditionally feminine are like princessy things and therefore she doesn't want to do them because cooking is definitely considered to be traditionally feminine by many cultures. But she's not allowed to do it because she's a princess and she actually likes to cook and is good at it. So I really like that this book doesn't say Cimmerine is different because she doesn't like to do feminine things and prefers to do masculine things. Cimmerine is just different because she didn't want to be pigeonholed into this life with activities that she didn't find stimulating. She also really loves scholarly pursuits. I know a lot of books can fall into a trap when they're trying to make their I don't want to be a princess princesses, you know, different enough. They fall into the trap of making princess things just feminine things and then the as a result of the I don't want to be a princess princess rebels against that by wanting to do only masculine things and Simmerine isn't like that and I really appreciate that about her and about this book. Oh Simmerine taking advice. She she decides that the best thing to do might be to run away but she's not sure she wants to do it because it's dangerous. The frog says do you want any advice or not? Yes, please, said Simmerine. After all, she didn't have to follow it. The frog gave her weird instructions for how to go about finding people who can help her, which involve some fantasy-esque things, uh, such as passing by some special trees and, like, ignoring any voices she hears calling out to her, and coming to a hovel and knocking the appropriate amount of times and such. Were this a more modern sort of fairy tale book, I think we would get more detail in this beginning. This beginning is not very detailed because we are in a hurry to get Simmerine away to where the dragons are. But we are given very sparse details about her current life and she goes to, to the formal banquet with Therindil, which she hates, but we don't 
find anything out about the formal banquet. It's just that she hates it. She had to sit next to Therondale and listen to endless stories of his prowess in battle. And I feel like if this was a more modern version of this book, we would actually get some of those stories of his, some examples of how insufferable he is. We got a small example when she went to talk to him in the armory that was very short which is good. But I think nowadays we trend more towards getting even more of that. I think this book still pulls it off, but I am also inclined towards having a little bit more detail and a little bit more example of things, a little bit more showing instead of telling. But again, this book's writing is so charming that you generally don't mind that you're being told a lot of this information, which goes to show that you can tell instead of show, but you have to have the skills to pay the bills. You have to be good at it. Simmerine does know a little bit of magic, and she casts a, an invisibility spell over herself, which you think she would use more often, to be honest. But I don't recall, because I've read this book multiple times, I don't recall her really using her magic later in the story, so I think that is kind of a thing about her that's a little bit dropped. And I think that maybe it should have just been dropped here at the beginning and not really had her know any magic and just have her sneak out. Maybe she could have trained with her father's spy master or something. She gets to these trees with this little thing that she was like this little pavilion that she was warned about and it looks like a really nice place to stop but she remembers that she was warned and even though there's an enticing voice that calls to her she's like no I'm not gonna do it because um, I know better. I don't think this scene necessarily needs to be here, but it does give us a little hint that Simmerine is a logical, thoughtful person, and she remembers and heeds warnings that she's received in the past. So she gets to the little hovel, she does the knocking that she was told, and she goes inside, and we are on to chapter two, which I'll probably go ahead and read. Chapter two is called In Which Simmerine Discovers the Value of a Classical Education and Has Some Unwelcome Visitors. Simmerine goes into the hovel and is accosted by several voices that can't seem to decide if they want to eat her or not. This would be the perfect time for an invisibility spell, but she doesn't use it. But one of the voices tells the others not to eat her and wants to hear her story, so Simmerine is going to tell them about her life. And of course, once she does, they reveal themselves to be a bunch of dragons. Five dragons. Simmerine has also kind of been teleported to a cave through this hovel. Right away we get a really interesting factoid about dragons that I like, especially for when this book was written. Each of the males, there were three, had two short, stubby, sharp-looking horns on either side of their heads. The female dragon had three, one on each side and one in the center of her forehead. The last dragon was apparently still too young to have made up its mind about which sex it wanted to be, and it still didn't have any horns at all. So that's an, a factoid about the dragons in this world, is that they choose what gender or and or sex they want to be when they're older. There are not great things about this, such as the dragon being referred to as it before it chooses its gender, but then again it is a dragon, so perhaps it's a bit more permissible. It's not perfect, but I do think it's really cool to have this like exploration of gender and choice of gender. Now we have a very traditional fairy tale moment that also informs us of a lot of things. Simmerine gets the idea that maybe she could work for the dragons because dragons uh, take princesses and keep them captive to cook and clean and so forth. But before she can convince them that that's a good idea for her, another dragon comes in and he's sneezing up a storm. He's having an allergy attack because a wizard was nearby. So we're finding out a lot of information in a, in a fast clip. And now Simmerine has a chance to offer the dragon, the sneezy dragon, a handkerchief. Which is kind of that classic moment of human does something kind for a large creature, a large scary creature. The thorn in the paw moment, if you will. That's her in with these dragons. We're also getting introduced to Warrag, who is the dragon who wants to eat Simmerine. Again, I just love Simmerine. Well, I'm not a proper princess then, Simmerine snapped. I make cherries jubilee, and I volunteer for dragons, and I conjugate Latin verbs. Or at least I would, if anyone would let me. So there. Turn down for what? The dragons are like, who would want an improper princess? And the female dragon, Kazool, says that she would. Kazool loves cherries jubilee, and the Latin scrolls in her library are in desperate need of cataloging. 
So Cimmerine sets herself up in the room that was abandoned by the previous princess that Kazool had had, who ran off with a knight, and she gets straight down to work organizing the treasure room. One thing I do wonder, as Cimmerine settles in and she cooks dinners for the dragon and organizes the treasure rooms and such, where do they get the food? Like, where is she getting the cherries for this cherries jubilee that she's making? It's, it's a fairy tale, so it doesn't matter, but it does make me wonder. There's a lovely Lord of the Rings reference, Cimmerine sorting the treasure room, and she's not sure about the rings. It was sometimes hard to tell whether a ring was enchanted, and Cimmerine knew better than to put it on and see. It might be the sort of useful magic ring that turned you invisible, or it might also be the sort of ring that turned you into a frog. This book does have one of the sins that I often point out. It's not a serious sin, but it is something to think about eliminating. Cimmerine was thinking to herself. You can just say thinking because normally you don't think to anyone except yourself. As Cimmerine is sitting and polishing up some swords, she hears a voice outside and she goes to investigate to find a knight shouting about fighting the dragon and rescuing Cimmerine. And Cimmerine gives this poor knight a lesson in how to properly challenge a dragon because she's just a badass like that. She had always been more interested in what the knights and dragons were supposed to say than in memorizing the places where she was supposed to scream. We get a little hint about an upcoming character. It's very small, and if you don't know who it is, you would blink and miss it. But the knight demands to know where Kazool is, and Cimmerine says that she has gone to the other side of the Enchanted Forest to pick up to borrow a crepe pan from a witch that she knows. Now, having read this book many times, I know who that witch is. But reading it, you'd blink and you'd miss it. And I think that's the kind of, like, I guess foreshadowing, if that is foreshadowing, that you want to see, where it's like, going back and reading the book again, you're like, oh, it's not just any old witch, it's not just a throwaway thing. Before she sends the knight on his way, he informs Cimmerine that her father has promised half his kingdom to whoever can free her, so there are going to be many more knights coming to attempt to rescue Cimmerine, about which she is not very happy. Finally, after many, many knights which Cimmerine sends away, Prince Therindil turns up. Some of these lines, I just... I just love this book so much, and that's probably boring to hear, but just... Cimmerine says that there have been eight knights here to rescue her so far, and Therindil's like, only eight? There's not much glory in defeating a dragon that hasn't already beaten ten or fifteen people at least. Sir Gorilax of Mistwold wouldn't even consider going after a dragon whose score is less than forty-five. And with that, we reach the end of the chapter. Cimmerine has told him off and told him to leave, and that closes down chapter two. And I will stop reading for tonight, and we'll catch up with Cimmerine in chapter three, whatever that may be. Before we begin thanking patrons, I just want to give a special shout out to our latest patron, Adrian, who asked that I highlight their new YouTube channel, which goes under Rien Blackbird, but you're not going to be able to find it without a link currently, so you will find that link in the doobly-doo. Go check it out. I don't know if they have any videos up yet, but keep your eye on it, alright? And now let's get to thanking all my lovely patrons. Hello, new month, new patrons. Who have we got on our patron list this month? We have Lennox, Adrienne, Amanda, Irene, Jenny, Jesper, Kim, Lisa, Ryakio, Savvy Panda, Savvy, and Scribbling Cat. I'm sure I mispronounced at least one of those names. If you would like to have your name professionally mispronounced, then you can join my amazing patrons over on Patreon. 